Philippians chapter 5. We're going to read through about 11 verses. I'll give you a minute to get there. It's not a book that you read quite a bit. If you like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but you got to like them all too. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But at the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then such destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. For you are children, you are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, or whether we're alive or whether we're dead, and we have died, that's what it means there, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, edify one another, even as also you do. Conversation this week prompted this message. My wife and I had a conversation with some people this, this last week, and as we were talking about the end times that we're living in, we could tell the individual that we were speaking with really didn't have a clue of anything that was going on. Just kind of like oblivious to really what's going on in the world and what's going on in the spiritual world as well as in the natural world. So I kind of got to thinking and just kind of just kept stirring in me and kept boiling in me that I'm wondering how many people in the church don't have a clue of where we're at this time period. Let alone the people in the world. I can't expect people outside of the church to really have much of a clue of what's going on in the spiritual realm even what God is doing. Sure, they're cognizant of things kind of going gunny bag because of the pandemic and because of economic things going on and the political things that are going on. And, and if we don't look outside of our box, we'll only think that this pertains to America, but it doesn't. It pertains to the entire world that we live in. I don't know if you watched the news this week or not, but <clears throat> great things that happen in Israel <laughs> and all of those things. But also, at the same time, <coughs> if you're paying attention, you'll see that the pandemic is really stretching its tentacles deep into Israel right now in a huge way. Lots, lots of a thousand people a day or something like that. It's crazy. It's going on. <coughs> so you've got to open your eyes, and this is what really kind of stirred me up a little bit by this conversation is that a lot of people's eyes aren't open and their ears aren't open and their hearts not open to what's going on. I mean, you know, it's easy to just live in a little comfort bubble where you live right now. And just kind of say, okay, this is just kind of something that we're going to pass through and everything's going to be just hunky-dory and tomorrow we'll wake up and the sun's going to be shiny like it was today with no smoke in the air. But that's not the way it's going to go in the world today. Things are starting to escalate on a downturn. And even people in the church need to wake up to the very truth of what is taking place. You need to prepare yourself in many different ways. You need to prepare yourself, number one, most importantly, is need to bring your relationship with Jesus Christ up to date. That's the first and foremost thing to do. You can no longer just play church and just kind of put church and God and the Word on a side burner. You need to strike a match under yourself for that is concerned. Like Timothy told, uh, like Tim, Paul told Timothy to fan the flame. In other words, stir that gift up within you and rekindle 
that first love that you have for Jesus. That's a first and foremost thing. But you also need to be prepared, not only spiritually, but you need to be prepared physically for what's coming down the line. You need to make preparations for food and water and protection and all of those kinds of things. I'm not a survivalist. Uh, I'm not somebody who just panics and all of those things, but I believe like Joseph, Joseph prepared for years of famine. He prepared for a time of drought. People need to be prepared for the thing that's coming down the line and not put your head in the sand. So, and I'm not gonna get into all of those types of things right now, but I am going to let you know that the Word of God tells us that we need to be watchful and we need to be aware and know the times that we live in. Paul just said that right here. And if you read the previous chapter of First Thessalonians and First Thessalonians, I can't hardly say it, but First Thessalonians chapter four, <laughs> you say that ten times real quick, and then you get through it, and then you can do it one time and leave. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you read the end of that, Paul is talking about the rapture of the church. He's talking about the coming of Christ. He's talking about the end of the church age. And then he goes into 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and he said the times and the seasons that we should not be ignorant of. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour that Jesus is coming. We don't know that. Only the Father knows that time. He is the only one. And so he will let the sun know when that time takes place. <clears throat> but we are not to be ignorant of the times that we're living in. And I'm thinking that this is where a lot of people are. They don't really understand where we're at. This is not a natural disaster. This is not a natural undertaking. This is a spiritual undertaking that is bringing us to the culmination of the age that we're in. And we really need to wake up to that, okay? We really need to, to bring ourselves back. Paul talks here about the times and the seasons. He uses two words there, chronos and kairos. Chronos is, just happens to be a, a terminology that means like all times, like could be five minutes ago, or it could have been uh, 40 years, like the 40 years in the wilderness. That, that's a chronos of time. Galatians 4.24 talks about a chronos of time. When the fullness of time will come, Christ was revealed. That's a chronos. That just that means, like, deals with all times. We're in a chronos right now. But there, then the word seasons there is the word kairos. That word kairos simply means that it is an epic-making period of time that has the marks of God all over it. Okay? Like Acts 2, chapter 2 would be a good example, where it says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come. That's a kairos of God. The fingerprints of God were all over. It was an epic making period of time that we were in. And we're about ready to come to that epic making period of time with the rapture of the church. During this time that we live in, there is a time of preparation. We need to be very watchful of. We need to see what God is doing. And the scripture here tells us in verses 2 through 4, he says that we need not to be ignorant of those times that we live in. We need to make uh, preparation and not to be surprised by them. Everybody say surprised. So you're not going to wake up one day and just find out, oh, already we're in the end times. That's not going to happen that way. We're not going to be surprised by them. A lot of people are kind of on the, on the on the thought pattern that one day we're going to wake up and all of a sudden the Antichrist is going to be born and revealed. That's not the way it works. I want you to understand, I believe right now, that the Antichrist is very much alive in planet Earth today. And things are being prepared to when the day is that he will be revealed who he is. And that day will be after you and I have already been raptured. If you read 2 Thessalonians, you'll find that to be the truth. Okay, so we know that all of these things are coming down the line. The wickedness that you see in the world today, it doesn't surprise God. How many of you understand that? God is not surprised by anything. And it should not surprise you or me. Because if you read your scriptures, if you read and you pay attention to what's going on, you know all of these things are coming to that kind of a head. So it should not surprise anybody. Look at verse 3. 
Look what it says. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. I like the, I like the analogy that Paul brings here about that. <clears throat> you know, it's no surprise when a woman gives birth, right? Because the outward signs of her pregnancy talks about something that is growing within her. You all follow that? This is the example that he's is showing you. It's not a surprise. You see a pregnant woman when she gives birth, you're not surprised that she gives that birth because that outward sign of her pregnant belly gives evidence of something that is going on on the inside in the unseen realm. This is what's happening today. The outward signs of everything that the scripture tells us that is going on around us today is an evidence of an unseen truth. Something that is growing, something that is going on. So if you were to read 2 Timothy chapter 3, you might just make these notes so you'll know what you should be reading. So you can see some things and you'll wake up to all of these things that are going on around you. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4, Jude verses 18 and 19, I'll give those to you again, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4, Jude. 18 and 19. Those are just a few that give you a hint of what goes on in these latter times. We're living in latter times. So if you are cognizant of those things that are going on around you, you'll understand that there is a winding down. Romans chapter 8 verse 22 declares unto us that all of creation is in labor pains. It's groaning in labor right now. And so the intensity of the contractions that we are seeing going on in the earth today, they're getting closer and closer and closer until this thing is birthed out. You'll see those things getting so close. And just the same way that you cannot stop the delivery of that baby, it's going to come in its due time. I mean, you understand, it's coming in its due time. You may think, well, God, my baby should have been born two weeks ago, but all of a sudden, two weeks after that, your baby is born because it was born in its what? Due time. Okay? Well, it's the same thing that Paul is talking about right here with that uh, child coming as a woman travailing in birth. It, it's going to come forth. The earth is travailing in its birth pains right now. It's in those contractions until this is birthed. Do you follow that? So this is what's going on in the world. It's coming in its two time. You cannot... You cannot stop this. It's going to come. And you need to be prepared. And notice there in verse 3, notice what they say. For they shall say peace and safety. And then sudden destruction will come upon them. You know, <clears throat> that's kind of what happened in the days of Noah, wasn't it? They were eating, drinking, marrying, being given in marriage, carrying on with their life, thinking, oh, okay, sirrah, everything is great. That fool over there is building a big old boat. That fool over there is saying that the judgment of God is coming. That fool over there is saying that rain is going to come and carry that big boat full of all these animals and go to carry them off, and him and his family, they're going to be saved. Then what happened? Sudden destruction. Judgment came. 
the warning signs came by the preaching of Noah, by the building of the ark, by the obedience that Noah displayed, the people said no. The same thing is going to happen here. Peace and safety will come. You listen to the voices of people today. They're expecting miracles to take place come election day. They're expecting that when the pandemic runs out, everything's going to be okay. They expect that Wall Street's going to shoot to record highs and everybody's going to be safe economically. Listen to what people say today. We're going to be great. The economy's going to be great. This is going to be great. This is going to be great. But nobody is saying righteousness will exceed. The glory of God will be poured out. You're going to see people repenting and restoration. You're going to see this great outpouring of God's Spirit. Everybody's focused on the greatness of what we can do in the natural. Peace and safety. We're all going to be okay. I've got news for you. It's not. There is going to be an outpouring of the judgment of God that will bring restoration. That will bring repentance. That will bring people back to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Things will get in order in that, in that realm. Yet in the midst, when there is revival that is happening... Judgment will be poured out. Amen. Understand, these messages are hard to hear, but they're necessary right. to hear. Because if we don't wake up to the truth of God's promises, we're in trouble. And you say, oh, promises. You just said promises. That means I get blessed and I get that. Yes. But the promises of God, too, are judgment. Promises are true to this. It says and declares that if man doesn't repent, they will burn. Plain and simple. Peace and safety, they say. What does the word say? They say peace and safety, but the word says sudden yeah. destruction. That's what it says. So the thing is, is that people need to see the warning signs. The warning signs around us that judgment is coming is abortion. The warning signs that judgment is coming is the acceptance of homosexual behavior, the changing of gender, the acceptance of immoral Unrighteous actions. Those are warning signs. And every day it gets deeper and deeper. It gets bigger and bigger. The acceptance of what is wrong. It just amazes me. And this world will be judged. It's coming. Peace in safety? No. Sorry. Paul tells us there are some things here that we need to do. And by the way, I just want to just make one more point about verse 3. Look at the very last line of verse 3. They shall not escape. Ooh. If you think that peace and safety is coming and you're okay without Jesus, you shall not escape. What shall you not escape? Hell. Mm. Eternal damnation. God. That's God's truth. But the awesome thing is that you're hearing this today and you have an opportunity to make a way of escape. 
And if you choose not to, you'll be held accountable for this 20th day of September at 11.30 in the morning of these words that you have just heard and had the opportunity to make a change. For God tells by the Holy Spirit to the Apostle Paul in verse 6, he tells you some things that you and I as the church need to do. And if I can just put it succinctly without a whole lot of words, wake up. <laughs> really what he says. Wake up. Look what he says. Therefore, let us, talking to the church, let us not sleep as others, but let us watch and be sober. Let us watch and be sober. And look at verse 8. Let us, everybody say, that's me. That's me. Who are of the day? You see, who are of the day? Children of God. Born again Christians. Not religious people. Not people who are in a cult thinking that they're safe because they're religious. Or people in a denomination that think they're safe because they're in the denomination. Talking about Born again, children of Almighty God. Those people who have confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Who have repented of their sins and have invited Him into their lives and have received His salvation, washed in His precious blood. Amen. Those are who He's talking to. Let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. What he tells us to do right there. Be sober. That simply means, number one, be calm and collected. Nobody wants to follow a panic leader. Right? He'll run you off a cliff and drown you in the river. That's just what will happen. Be calm. Be collected. In your spirit, man. Once you get calm and collected in your spirit, man, it's easy for you to walk in faith. It's easy for you to walk in love. It's easy for you to think with a clear mind. You must do something inside first. Okay? And as you get things done on the inside, things will get done on the outside. <laughs> it's just the way it works. Don't do it the other way around. Don't think you can get everything in order out here and not take care of this. You'll be in order here but this will be in total disarray. Get it the other way. Get this first on the inside. Okay, so notice here that he says, be sober, get calm, get collected in spirit, have faith, love, and, and know who you are in Christ. <clears throat> One of the things that we need to do that he tells us to, to do here is to look at things from a different perspective. What do you mean? He doesn't say that. Yes, he does. He says that if you will put on the breastplate of faith, if you will walk in love and, and put on a helmet of hope for salvation, you'll have things from a different perspective. We have a tendency of wanting to look at how things are working out here. We have a tendency to look at the disruption of our society, the closing of businesses. We have a uh, a tendency to look at the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the fires and all of these things that are going on and we get focused on all of these disruptions that, disruptions that are out there. We have a tendency of becoming distracted from what is real to you and to me and that is that relationship with Jesus Christ. The reality of the truth of the word, the empowering, the anointing of the Holy Spirit and we get disrupted with those things. But Paul tells us to do something differently. He says, don't look at those circumstances around you. Know the times, know the seasons, know what's going on. He said to know them. But he says to do this. Look at things from a different perspective. Jesus does that in Luke chapter 21. When he talks about the second coming of Christ. When he talks about the rapture of the church. He says, look up for your redemption draw it not. So we need to have a different perspective on how we are looking at things. Look at things from God's view, not from man's view. It'll look a lot better to you. 
Amen. I may be understand. God really knows that things look better through his eyes than yours. <laughs> Amen. Paul even teaches us how to do that too in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17 and 18. He says, For our light affliction, which works for us a much greater weight in glory, while we look not at the things that are seen, but we look at the things that are unseen. For the things that we see are only temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So what we need to do is we need to have things at a little different perspective. We know that the fires are temporary. We know the tornadoes are temporary. We know the earthquakes and the, all the stuff that's going on around us are temporary, but they are signs of something that is working that is even greater than those signs that are working out there. So what we need to do is we need to look at things in a whole lot different way. We need to see them differently with a different perspective. God's got something bigger in store for us. Can you say amen? amen. amen. So those birth pains, really, that we're seeing that's going on around us, that's what all this stuff is. It's just birth pains. We're getting ready to get birthed into something greater, and it's going to be much greater than you and I could ever, ever imagine. Amen? So what we need to do is we need to get focused on what he's doing in the eternal realm. And then when we do that, then the temporary things around us won't seem so big. But don't stick your head in the sand and pretend they're not happening. They are happening. That's right. And we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared. See, David knew how to do this with God. He knew how to, to take care of the temporary things that were coming around. How many of you understand that David was a man after God's own heart? A man of praise, a man of worship, a great king, great leader. He was a type of Jesus. He was a prophet, priest, and king, just like Jesus. David, out of his loins came the lineage of Jesus. God had an incredible anointing on that man's life. How many of you know, even though he had an incredible anointing on his life, and God used him in a mighty way, and he was a man of worship, and a man of praise, a man of faith, that David fought many battles. Amen. Not only did he fight physical battles, but he also had to fight in the spiritual realm. And David knew how to fight those <coughs> battles in the spiritual realm, as well as in the physical realm. Y'all remember when David lost his uh, city of, of uh, Ziklag, and the first thing that David did, he, he didn't fight the natural battle first. He fought the spiritual battle. First he called for the wind and ephod. Then he began to inquire of the Lord. So he began to offer worship, praise, and intercession to know exactly what to do in order to fight and successfully defeat the enemies that had stolen everything from him. So David knew how to fight the physical, but he also knew how to fight those emotional and spiritual things for, which were going on around him. In Psalm 42, 5, David makes these statements. He says, why are you so disquieted within me? Why are you so, if I can put it this way, out of the King James Version, uh, move away from the King James Version, why are you so bothered on the inside? <laughs> why is things going so haywire on the inside? I've never felt like you've been going haywire on the inside. Mm -hmm. So David asked this question of himself. He didn't ask the Lord the question. David asked himself the question. And I think a lot of times what we need to do is we need to look in the mirror and make an honest assessment of where we're at. Make an honest assessment where we're at. Why am I so troubled on the inside? What's going on? And then David answers his own question. He says this, oh, and I'm paraphrasing. Oh, I know. Put your hope, put your trust in God. He returned back to where he should have been focused on the whole time. Instead of being focused on all this pressure from the outside, David needed to put his focus back on the one who could relieve him of his pressure, and that was back on the Lord. So then he enters into that place of praise. He enters back into that place of trust, that place of faith. 
that he needed to get back into. And we need to do that. We need to get focused back on that. He says it again there in Psalm chapter 5, where he talks about in the morning will he lift up his voice unto the Lord. And he says to the Lord, he says, consider my meditation. Consider the voice of my crying. Consider my heart. Lord, take and look at me and consider what I'm offering back up to you in that place of praise, in that place of worship. So what we need to do is we need to get focused back on the important things, right? Turn with me, if you will, because I want to read this to you. Psalm 121. Here's another thing, how David got <clears throat> focused. Look what he says. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. For my help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer your foot to be moved. He that keeps you will not slumber. You can rest assured God is not sleeping on the job. <laughs> Aren't you glad for that? Okay, behold, he that keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor shall he sleep. God is keeping you. You are Israel. You say, when he says there he keeps Israel, who is Israel? Israel is the church. If you read Galatians, Paul says to the church, there he says, you are the Israel of God. You are God's Israel. Yes, there's a national Israel, but there's a spiritual Israel. Amen. And you are spiritual Israel. God will not slumber, he'll not sleep, and he will keep you. Now notice, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade upon your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Glory to God. Thank you. That word preserve simply means to hedge you about. God wants to hedge you about. When you have a hedge of protection that is around you, the enemy doesn't come in. He put a hedge of protection around you from the judgment that is to come. See, the scripture says that he that breaks a hedge, the serpent comes in and bites him. We are responsible for keeping our hedge in tack around our life. First John chapter 5 verse 8 says this, he that keeps himself, the wicked one, touches him not. We're responsible for keeping that hedge intact. You remember on the Passover, remember the blood that was put over the doorpost. The destroyer could not touch him because of the blood. God hedges you about, protects you with the precious blood of Jesus. But it's up to you to keep it intact. That's what the scripture declares unto us. So when we get a break in our hedge because we're walking in unrighteousness and in sin. There is a hole in our hedge. And the enemy comes in and tries to bring destruction. It's up to you to repent. It's up to you to restore that hedge. God will do it if the scripture says this. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. The blood brings that hedge closed again in our life. Get focused back on God. Get your focus off of what's going around you. Doesn't mean be oblivious to it. It just simply means not to make that your central point of focus. Ask God for wisdom. What do I need to do, God, in this time? What do I need to do to prepare? Lord, do I need to put some waters and, and have an a, a excess of water available? Listen, I want you to understand, there are things that are going to happen in the natural that you may not think are going to happen. 
But you look at what's going on in your grocery stores. You look what's going on in your banking industry. You look what's going on all across the board. There are things of preparation that you need to be asking the Lord what you need to do. You need to have some uh, provisions of food on hand that you would not normally have. I'm telling you right now, hear this preacher. I am not a panic guy. And if it means you stop buying, excuse me, more Dutch Brothers than you do, if it means that you stop going out and supporting McDonald's more than you do, you need to do that in order to make provision for the future for your family right now. <laughs> Somebody said, out, show me, or whatever. <laughs> but I am serious. What you need to do is stop satisfying the flesh now to make provision for the spirit and the flesh later. You can't say, Pastor, nobody ever told me. Why didn't you tell me this? I've been trying to tell you this for several years. <laughs> but now we're coming to the fruition of what's going on. And again, this isn't a thing of fear. It's not a thing of panic. It is a thing of wisdom. Amen. And we need to know and understand the times. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 5. Look at verse 8. Look what Paul tells you to do. Let us who are of the dead be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. There's two things that you need to do that Paul tells you here guard your heart and guard your mind. Guard your heart and guard your mind. Put on the breastplate of faith. What is the breastplate? It moves and guards over your heart. Put on the helmet that guards your mind. You don't guard your heart and you don't guard your mind. You could get bitter. You can't afford bitterness. You can't afford unforgiveness. You can't afford those things that will rob you of the very things that God wants to bless you with. And I, and I want to just deal with this area real quickly. Most people in here don't have a problem in this area, but there are some who do. And that's with the area of the tithe. And I'm not, you know me, if anybody's known me over the last 30 some years, you know I'm not a guy that goes after money. I'm a, I go after God. <laughs> but hear me. If you haven't been tithing, don't expect God to continue to bless or bring blessings to make for financial and other provisions for your life. Amen. Amen. Jesus said to make friends with the unrighteous mammon, for in the day when it fails, it will support you. That's kind of a, you know, a head scratcher, <laughs> isn't it? But nevertheless, what it simply means is this. Do right with your money now so that when it all fails, there will be support that will carry you through the times. We can't tip God and expect for the blessings of God to come on our life and provide for our life. When God says to tithe, he means that you give 10% of your increase that which increases into your household. If I can put it this way, if you made $100 this week, $10 belongs to God. Not only that, he gives you the 90, and then he adds blessing and blessing and blessing on top of that. But you can't be sporadic in your tithe, and you cannot say, well, I'll just go ahead and withhold. You can't do that and expect God to support you during the time of need. Please, I'm not being, I'm not pounding anybody for money or any of those kinds of things, but understand it's the truth of God's word. Amen. And you need to understand that if you don't plant a seed, you can't grow a harvest. Amen. Just the way it works. Okay? Enough of that. Guard your heart, guard your mind. 
Don't get fearful about money and saying, well, if I give it now, that when things start getting tight, I won't have any. No, that's not how it works. You give it now, and you won't have to worry about it when the times get hard. You'll have more than enough. Okay? So fear cannot capture a guarded heart. Fear cannot capture a guarded heart. It won't happen. And faith that works by love will keep your heart and keep your mind. Did you get that? Okay. Fear cannot capture a guarded heart. And faith that works by love will keep both your mind and your heart. Those are areas that we really need to work on in our life. Because the report on the TV, the report on the radio, the report on the signs, the report that's coming here and the report that's coming there can easily try to capture your heart and capture your mind. If you don't have this to guard your heart and your mind, it'd be a little bit hard not to walk in fear. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word, and faith dispels fear every time. Faith will trump fear every time. <clears throat> See, when you allow fear to come in, you get in agreement with the world. When you let faith come in, you disagree with the world and you agree with God. And I don't know about you, but I don't want fear in my heart to disagree with God. Remember that agreement empowers. Every time you get in agreement with fear, it empowers fear. When you get in agreement with the Word, it empowers the Word. And the Word is much more powerful than fear ever thought about me. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. You can write this down. This will give you something to think about. It says that, <clears throat> be anxious for nothing. I mean, you understand that when you're anxious for something, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, be anxious for nothing. <laughs> I mean, you understand that when you get anxious, you make mistakes. Fear rules you rather than faith. You're ruled by your flesh, you're real, ruled by your emotions. And everything when you are anxious about something. He says, be anxious for nothing. But with everything, with prayer and thanksgiving, let supplication, let your request be made known <laughs> unto God. And notice what he says, and the peace of God will garrison. Your word, your King James doesn't use the word garrison, but it simply means a garrison is an army that is encamped all around about you. He says that he will build a garrison around your heart and your mind. Be anxious for none. With everything, with prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and he will keep, he will guard your heart. Isn't that nice? Notice what he says after that. He doesn't stop. He says, think on these things. What? There is something that keeps you from having the peace of God. There is something that keeps you from having uh, your request and your supplications, your prayers be known unto God that keeps the peace of God from coming in and guarding your heart is that when you think opposite of these things that he tells you to think of. Look at what he says there in the next verse. Think on these things. Everything that is true. Everything that is honest. Everything that is just. Everything that is pure. Everything that is lovely. Everything that is of a good report. Everything that has virtue in it. Everything that has praise in it. Everything that has these things. Think on those. So you and I need to kick out all that negativity that comes to us 
from this world that is around us, that keeps us from moving forward in the things of God and resting and being sober, being vigilant and watching what God is doing. And we panic and back away from those things. But God has a plan for you and me as the church, the body of Christ, is that we are going to display to the rest of the world, yeah, everything else, we can say it this way, is going to hell in a handbasket. We're going to heaven in a rapture. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Forward to it. Hallelujah. So what we need to do is that we need to display to the rest of the world the truth of that. Don't, don't <clears throat> put your head in the sand. Can I read you one more scripture? You got time for that? Come with me in a second, Peter. I just really think that you need to see this. 2 Peter chapter 3. I'm not going to spend a lot of time being exegetical. I just think that we just need to read this so that you're aware of what the Word says. And this deals with the time that we live in. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you. In both which I stir up your pure minds by a way of remembrance. <laughs> we forgot some things, didn't we? That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, and who was our Savior. Understand, this is not just New Testament thing that has come about. This is something that has been written since the very beginning all the way through. This is what Paul, our, Paul is, our Peter is talking about. Knowing this, first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, people have been poo-pooing the second coming of Christ for a long time. <laughs> Say, nah, it ain't gonna happen, it ain't gonna happen. We'll just do what we want to do. Guess what? This is nothing new under the sun, folks. For this they willingly are ignorant of. That by the word of God the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto the fire, against the day of judgment, and <clears throat> the ruin, the loss, the destruction of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. And the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men would call, call, as some men would count slackness, but is very, very patient to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, just like Paul said in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person should you be in all holy lifestyle and godliness, looking for and hastening until the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, we look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you found in him in peace without spot and blindness. There's a whole lot in there. And due to time, I won't take the time to explain those things. But the one thing that I want you to understand enough is verse 9 and 10. Tell us that the only reason that Jesus has not come yet, one reason, that God is patiently waiting, 
that one more person will come to Christ Jesus. He is patient in that. We can't scoff and say, well, I guess it's not going to happen because this has happened, this has happened, but I guess it's just something else that is passing. That's not what it says there. It says these things are going to happen, but God is putting off just in hopes that more of His creation will come and believe upon the work that His Son has done on the cross of Calvary. That one more will say yes to Jesus. One more will be rescued out of hell. But he says this right here. Know this. That that day is coming. And you don't know when. It's a thief. You don't know. Like a thief in the night. Could be tonight. Could be tomorrow night. You don't know. So stop putting off the spiritual things that need to be done. Give your heart to Christ. God loved you with an everlasting love. That's why he sent Jesus. To rescue you from hell. God has not appointed us under wrath, the scripture says. As the church is not appointed unto that wrath. That wrath that is to come. The tribulation period that is coming. The judgment of hell that comes to those who reject God's only begotten Son. We have been rescued from the pit of hell by the precious blood of Jesus. Church, there's an admonition to both in this message this morning. One is to the church wake up, be attentive to what's going on, understand the time. And the other message is to those who have not yet received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That while there is yet breath in your body, you have that opportunity. But the scripture says you don't know what tomorrow brings. You have no idea. You can't be guaranteed your next minute, your next second, your next breath. This is the only time that you have. Today is the day of salvation. Now it's the acceptable right now. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, you've never asked Him to forgive you of your sins and come into your life to be your Lord and your Savior, right now is a great opportunity. Those of you that are watching by whatever media source that you're watching right now, wherever you're at, stop. Take a moment right now. Know this. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Whoever would believe up in you would not perish. But they would have everlasting life. God loves you so much that he expensed the life of his own son so that you could live. And the scripture says that if you will believe in your heart that he is the only begotten son of God and that he died for your sin, that he rose from the dead, said with your heart you can believe the righteousness, but with your mouth confession is made unto salvation. And there's a scripture that is so great because it's a promise to you. It says, whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord, they would be saved. Whoever was born on the face of this earth, and that's you, that's me, anyone else who's listening, there are whosoever and the promise from God is if you will call on the name of Jesus right now, you can have eternal life. Just pray this simple prayer that says this. Lord Jesus, I believe that you're the only begotten Son of God, that you died for my sin. I'm a sinner. You are the only Savior. Forgive me of all of my sins and come into my life and be my Lord and be my Savior. Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Savior and my Lord in Jesus' name. Pray that prayer and know full well this, that God has forgiven you of every sin. You have eternal life in Christ Jesus and you have the promise of heaven. Find a Bible, find a church, wherever you might be. A Bible-believing church, one that believes the word of the living God. Don't just find a religious organization. You find 
a church that believes the word of the living God, that believes that Jesus is the only way of salvation. Find that church. Find it. Get involved with it. You'll be glad you did. God bless you.